Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com and GRTV.ca. And today we're joined on the line by Dr. Tim Anderson, the author of The Dirty War on Syria, uh, The Dirty War on Syria, a book from Global Research Publishers. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a senior lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney and researches and writes on development rights and self-determination in Latin America, the Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. And he has published dozens of chapters and articles in a range of academic books and journals. So, Dr. Anderson, thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thanks, James. Let's talk about this new book, The Dirty War on Syria. What was your motivation in writing this book? Yeah, largely because of the huge disinformation campaign that I saw beginning back in 2011, and in particular the not credible explanations for how the violence erupted in Dara initially. And I started investigating that and then I joined some Syrian Australians in their campaigns to defend Syria and I more or less, um, it, was a, it was a studying, a learning experience for me um, and eventually that, that turned into the idea of a book. In your preface, you write that although every war makes ample use of lies and deception, the dirty war on Syria has relied on a level of mass dis disinformation not seen in living memory. Can you elaborate on that? What types of disinformation have been at play in this, the Syrian war? Well, I mean, the historical reference is that, um, you know, I remember the Vietnam War and many wars since then, and there's always been that disinformation. But the surprising thing was with our access to the internet these days, which has really allowed some openings that didn't exist before, um, I'm really surprised and shocked as an educator that people are still captured by the, the media monopolies and, and the media monopolies have been really monolithic on this particular war. They've banned any dissenting narratives basically about the war um, there are very clear limits where they will not go. And um, it's been disturbing really to see how many people, including I should say people on the left, uh, liberal left people in, in Western countries who are captured by this, they, they can't seem to find their way out of it. Um, and so that's alarming to me as an educator, given that our educated populations these days in terms of formal education are higher than they've ever been. And yet, the capture of public thought about this war, what they imagine it's about, the fact that they keep, even though they've been lied to many times before in previous wars not that long ago, um, there's an extraordinary uh, extraordinary um, uh, success, really, that the Western powers have had in, in maintaining the sort of the narrative of this war. So, for example, um, initially the I. You can look at the war in different phases, I suppose. Very quickly it turned into what I call a humanitarian intervention phase where there were these claims that, and still persist that the government is doing nothing but killing its own people. For five years all the Syrian government and army has done is kill its own people. Well, you know, a lot of people seem to swallow that basically. And then came the, the, the next phase really, which was the protective intervention, the idea that the Western governments... Uh, are not really contributing to this war. They're actually playing some protective role by by in, engaging in a war on terrorism against the most extreme groups in Syria and Iraq, of course. Let's remember that these groups, these al-Qaeda groups, began in Iraq 10 years ago now um, for similar reasons that they're being used in Syria. So that sort of narrative is really... Uh, need some challenging and in a sense you can you could spend your whole life trying to argue with the myths of this war and I decided with the book to just do that partially because if you spend too much time on all of the, the fake stories that have been created it's worth doing it to some extent but you also have to pay attention to the actual experience of Syria and what's happening with this war you know I call it the A story and the B story basically in, in addressing a Western audience, we have to talk about the myths to some extent, but we can't get totally involved in those myths or we'll miss the point. It's like talking about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and not paying attention to what's actually happening in Iraq. Uh, 
It reminds one of that uh, our quote attributed to Karl Rove that uh, we are the masters of reality. We go around creating reality and you go around p- piecing it together. Um, and yes, if we get caught up too much in the specific details, that's all we end up doing. So let's let's confront the, the foundational myth of this war, that it is a, c- a civil war. Uh, if that is not the case, what is the case? Yes, that, you're right. It's, it's one of the foundational myths that the idea it's a civil war and that somehow the, the Western powers are some independent arbiters or, or assessors of what's going on and people who are going to intervene to try and put things right. So, you know, even uh, this is another extraordinary thing about the misinformation campaign. Most of the elements of the real story have been admitted in Western sources and by Western officials. And yet that doesn't really upset the, the, the false narrative. So, for example, the, the Pentagon, uh, US intelligence sources have admitted that there are hundreds of, hundreds of these groups and that there are many thousands, uh, ten, up to tens of thousands of foreign fighters involved in these extremist groups. Um, and the funding, uh, I mean, think initially there was a story about non-lethal aid to the opposition is one of the myths is that the Al-Qaeda groups are actually opposition groups in a sense that no other country would tolerate the idea that a political opposition is actually bombing civilians and army, whoever. No one tolerates the idea of an armed opposition in any country, but somehow it's called an opposition in Syria. Uh, and the spokespeople sent from Saudi Arabia to Geneva are really the, the spokespeople for those various Al-Qaeda groups. So, uh, you know, the civil war... Um, to some extent, there is a civil war. There has always been a Salafi faction, a, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood type that's involved in uh, armed insurrections in the past in Syria. But on this occasion, from the early days in 2011, there were um, large-scale uh, foreign uh, participation in the support for those groups. And that is how that group called Jabhat al-Nusra was created. It is a support front. That's what the words mean, the support front for the Syrian Salafis. Well, when they were defeated in Homs over 2012 um, into early 2013, um, really the the internationalisation of that conflict became massive through Turkey, um, through the Turkish borders, and that's where most of the arms and most of the fighters are coming these days through Turkey. Let's let's talk about some of those specific incidents that form the fabric of this myth that's been woven around us for the last four or five years at this point. Um, one of which, uh, well, one that I'm sure everyone will be familiar with to some extent, certainly in my audience, will be the, the chemical weapons uh, incident. But I, I want to talk more specifically about the Hula massacre, which came up in May of 2012. And result, it was uh, a, a, the death of 108 people and uh, non-fatal injuries to 300. A quite significant incident that was immediately trumpeted in the press as being uh, done at the hands of pro-government militias. But the actual narrative of this is somewhat more complicated. Can you Tell us a little bit about that that incident. Yeah, in brief, because it's actually one of the detailed chapters of the book, that one and the chemical weapons incident, because they had such significance on an international scale in terms of um, they were attempts to incite greater levels of Western military intervention in Syria, and they both of them failed. But um, the Hula massacre, for example, um, was his, in, in terms of its timing, um, you have to understand that after Dara, the, the uh, Islamist groups went in, into the Hula region from Tripoli in Lebanon. Um, this is at a time when Al Jazeera was covering up all of the foreign fighters coming out of Lebanon into, into that part of Syria. If you connect up the northern part of Lebanon with the, with the Homs area, there was an idea of a caliphate being established in that area between Tripoli, including Tripoli and Homs, or around Homs City, the, let's say the western part of Homs province. That would have been an area bigger than Lebanon. So there was an attempt there to establish the, the, the seat of the Islamist insurrection in Homs. And they embedded themselves in Homs City and it took actually some years before they were driven out of there. But they were initially driven out, of, most of them were driven out of Homs City. And this group was called the Farouk Brigade. There was another one called Khalid bin Walid Brigade. But the main group was the Farouk Brigade, which was a faction aligned with the so-called Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army 
we have to understand it has never been an army, really. It's been a conduit for weapons and finance, basically, to a range of groups. But Farouk was the biggest group, and it was a Syrian group. It was, if you like, the next generation of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, which had done a very similar insurrection in, in, um, in back in the early 80s, um, so in Hama. So the, the Farouk Brigade was effectively defeated around about that time. They were being driven out of, they and their, their partners, Jabhat al-Nusra, the, the official al-Qaeda group, which was uh, immediately embedded itself with, with that, those two groups, in particular Farouk Brigade. Um, Farouk had very strong social media. They were leading the, the way in terms of their, their videos and so on, um, pretending they were not uh, Islamist extremists. In, indeed, a number of Western think tanks um, branded them as uh, pious Sunnis or non-sectarian or something like this, uh, while they were ethnically cleansing Homs city, driving out the Christians in particular, killing pro-government people, um, they were reported in the Western media in, before the middle of, in, in May 2011 is the early point I can recall it, they were recorded with genocidal slogans, uh, uh, Christians to Beirut, Alois to the tomb, was the translation of their slogan that was being reported even in Western media in May 2011. So while they had genocidal slogans and they drove tens of thousands of Christians indeed to Beirut at that time, that was reported in the, the Christian newspapers at that time, they were imposing an Islamic tax. Um, so they were driven out of Homs City by the Syrian army over the end of 2000. 11, early 2012, and as they were leaving Homs City, they committed several massacres um, in villages around Homs City, one of which was Al Hula, as you mentioned. Now, that one became important because it was a massacre of civilians just after the uh, constitutional referendum and the congressional elections of early 2012, and they had indeed threatened to kill people who participated in those elections. Now, at that time, the United Nations still had a, a significant presence in Syria and were there was a, a UN committee which went to Hula under a Dutch general, uh, Robert Mood, and they, at that time, the, the Hula area was, uh, occu was uh, occupied, it was held by the Islamist groups, by Farouk and, and Khalid bin Walid and Jabhat al-Nusra. Now, when Robert Mood and his group went to Hula, they heard conflicting stories about what had gone on there and they offered to participate in further investigations. But at the UN level, they wound up that entire mission in Syria at that time and appointed another mission, which was based in Geneva, which never went to Syria. They rapidly prepared a report which blamed the government with no individuals, no motive, um, no detail at all. Um, they did, I think, eight more interviews by Skype. Um, and uh, in face of that uh a number of reports were coming out from German, Dutch, Russian sources and Syrian sources about uh, the participation of the Fruit Brigade in this. Um, and you had the motive, you had the opportunity, you had the, the historical circumstance, you had 15 eyewitnesses. In one chapter of my book, I detail the evidence from 15 eyewitnesses. Some of it had to be translated from um, different languages because of the various journalists that were there at the time. But there were 15 eyewitnesses identifying particular people, uh, some local families, the Farouk Brigade leaders themselves that when they participated in it um, and how they killed and who they killed them. So there's a great detail that Farouk Brigade uh, and some of their local collaborators had murdered those people. Those people, by the way, were included people who had participated in the election, families of people who had participated in the election and were considered pro-government. That's why they were killed. But... Of course, you know, the, the, the so-called uh, official truth, you know, about Hula from this second UN committee co-chaired by a North American diplomat um, was pretending to, you know, write the, write the official truth outside Syria. But that collapsed because largely because of the Russian and Chinese uh, role in the Security Council. Well, you do an admirable job of summing up that uh, that that incident, in, and as as you say, there is much more detail in the chapter in the book itself. So I will direct people there for more information on that. Let's step back to the meta level here. Um, 
given that this is not a Syrian civil war and is in fact a war of imperial aggression from outside the country or fomented from outside the country, wh- why? What is the purpose of this? Why Syria? Why now? Well, let's not forget if you're talking meta narratives, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Iran, which for well, a number of years seemed like it was the beginning of World War III. You know, this entire unilateral disarmament process, which the Iranians patiently participated in for many years and eventually got an outcome because, um, uh, to the chagrin of the leaders of Israel, uh, the, you know, the Washington decided that it was uh, Iran was too difficult at this time when they were bogged down with Syria. But if you look at the whole region for the last 15 years or so, it's really been an attempt to do a clean sweep across the region and dismantle any sort of independent regime, including um, a regime such as that of Saddam Hussein, which was previously collaborating with the US but became a rogue in, in some sort. Um, that This was part of a project which uh, George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice called the New Middle East, the idea of a new uh, uh, a new constellation of countries which were going to be much more US friendly, let's say I'm, I'm leaving out the rhetoric of freedom and all the, all the other sorts of things that are used typically. But uh, in effect, they, they thought they'd succeeded in Afghanistan and Iraq. They, they did succeed in destroying Libya and Syria was next on the list effectively. Syria was the, and this was has been spelt out very clearly and very openly by a number of US politicians I saw just yesterday one of the uh, candidates for the election back in 2012 talking, spelling out exactly what it was and that uh, Syria was strategically located. It was a conduit between Iran and Hezbollah, which was uh, considered a major threat to Syria. They were an important link in the chain in providing weapons to the Palestinian resistance. They were the only major ally of Iran in the region. Uh, let's remember Iran and Syria are the only two countries in the region without US military bases. So the Israelis in particular, would uh, they, they, they hid their involvement in the war against Syria because they're universally hated in the region. But in more recent times, they've been more open about helping any particular group whether it's Free Syrian Army or Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS, they've specifically not denied involvement with any of those groups. They've said they're helping all of them um, to overthrow Syria. So Syria was the important link in the chain. Iran, the last major independent in the con- uh, country in the region, but um, the Obama administration admitted last year that was just too hard, put it in the too hard basket, put it on the back burner, as indeed Syria was on the back burner. Let's remember the US had sanctions against Syria um, during the occupation of Iraq, Syria had taken the largest number of refugees from Iraq, up to 2 million refugees. It still holds the largest number of refugees from Iraq, around 400,000 in Syria today, despite five years of war. Uh, But sanctions were imposed during that time by the Bush regime because Bush considered that Syria was um, supporting the resistance, even though they acknowledged that Syria was very anti-Al-Qaeda then as now. Um, but they, they accused them of supporting the resistance in Iraq and so sanctions were first imposed then then later on during this war in, in 2011-2012. Well, finally, who do you envision as the audience for your book specifically? Is this intended for people who don't know any of this information, who have swallowed all of the media disinformation about Syria? Is it intended for people who know about it, um, who are concerned about this? Who Who do you aim this book at? Well, I say in the book, it's specifically aimed at a, an honest, curious Western audience. In other words, people who are, think that there's some point in reading and some point in looking at evidence and not just um, looking at sort of countering narratives in the media. If people are genuinely cu- curious and honestly curious, because, of course, there are some people who are going to keep believing that Saddam Hussein bombed the, the towers in New York in 2001, you know, so... Um, People who are so set in their ways, you can't really waste too much time. It goes back to the point I made about the A story and the B story. To some extent, you, I felt I had to address the myths, but I also want to say what's going on there. Now, that's who it was written for. Um, it may be that other people, but certainly there are other people who are reading it. I was presenting the book in Syria last month. The Arabic edition will be out next month. There's also a German edition which will be out next month. And I'm going to go back and talk in Germany and in Syria to... Uh, to people. So it's not written for them, but they're going to see something 
um, in it that that may be interesting for them. I don't know what that is yet. Although in Syria, some people said, "Well, this is really surprising. How come an Australian is writing this book?" That's one of the things they saw in it, you know. So sometimes you get other audiences interested, but it's mainly for a curious, honest Western audience that is genuinely puzzled uh, about the the line they've been spun about this war and wants to find out more. And so the sources reflect that too, really. There is, after five years of war, of course, there's a lot of information out there, but it's just a question of bringing it together in a co coherent sort of way. And uh, I decided to do it in a, in a fully academic way so people can go and check those sources if they want to go and follow up and find out more for themselves. And if people want to check the book themselves, uh, itself, of course, they can go to uh, globalresearch.ca and we'll include a link directly to so that you can go and purchase a copy of the book. Dr. Anderson, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks very much. Thanks.